Pastor Lindsay. Woohoo! Good morning. Oh, and Sammy, too. You want to go to class bed with Daddy? Okay. Hey, Jim, or one of the ushers, can you guys cut the fans? I'm going to be pulling hair out of my mouth the whole service if we don't. <laughs> this fine hair the Lord gave me just tickles my nose. I'll be sneezing. You can't have that. How is everybody this morning? Good. How many of you brought your pages Bible today? Yeah? Hang on, I'll hold mine up. I got a story about my pages Bible, but I got to get to my first text first. Stuff falling out of it. Oh, it's my Target registry card from when I got married. I don't know why that's in there. (laughs) All right, you see my Bible? Purple Bible. This was the first thing that I bought on the World Wide Web. And I was probably, oh gosh, it would have been like 1997, probably 97, first internet purchase. I feel so proud of that because I can say my first internet purchase was holy and spiritual. (laughs) What was yours? Uh, just kidding, but I remembered that the other day, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. That's cool. I wanted a purple Bible, and you couldn't find it anywhere, and my uncle introduced me to the internet. I didn't know what it was. He's like, let's search. Well, we're going to be talking today about a goodly heritage. Open your Bibles to Psalm 16, and I'm going to read from 1 through 6. But then we'll focus in on verses, on verse 6, for where we'll be kind of camping out today. Psalm 16, 1 through 6. It says, Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land... They are the glorious ones in whom all my delight, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. So I forgot that my first internet purchase was not a New King James Version Bible. So what's up on the screen is New King James Version, and this was NIV. So my bad, guys. Sorry about that. Um, This morning I want to talk about a goodly heritage, and I want to talk about spiritual inheritance. Um, That verse 6 says, The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. So I want to make a distinction before we move forward in the message today that inherited or heritage is about who we are and inheritance is about what we've received. So we have a spiritual inheritance that God has given us because we are the people of God, because we have this godly heritage. I talked a few weeks ago about the heritage of of Moses and Abraham and Martin Luther and uh, Charles Finney and James Russell and Raymond Bishop and Paul Bishop. That's all our heritage, right? That's the people that we are. We are the people of God called into his marvelous light, and we are receiving a spiritual inheritance as we continue to press into our godly heritage. Amen. Ephesians 1, 11 through 14. It says, In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. 
And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory, inherit to the praise of his glory. So inheritance is something that we receive, right? And typically you receive this inheritance in the physical when someone passes away, a parent or a grandparent passes away, the inheritance is then passed on. But in the God's economy, it's a little backwards, a little opposite. And it's in our death, we receive our inheritance. When we die to our flesh and surrender ourselves to Christ, that's when we receive this inheritance. So we can lay hold of this inheritance in Christ now. So what do we do with a spiritual inheritance? And why do we have it? What's the purpose? So first thing you got to do is you have to accept it, right? Someone leaves you an inheritance. Sometimes there's things that people leave us that we don't want. Like cats and things. <laughs> uh, I'm not a big cat person. Don't hate me. I'm just not. So don't anybody leave me their cat in their will, okay? Please. The first thing you've got to do is accept it. The inheritance that Christ has prepared for us is good, is acceptable, is lovely. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Who doesn't want that? That's our inheritance. So we've got to accept it. When you became born again, you were born into a royal family. The Bible says we are a royal priesthood. We were born as children of the king. So right now in the natural, we're kind of getting a front row seat as Queen Elizabeth passed we're watching the monarchy pass to the next generation. We're getting this natural view of what happens in the spirit when we come into the kingdom of God and we begin to gain access to all that is rightfully ours. And so I was reading the other day, there all the steps they're going through, and one of them is like all of the currency has to change. The face changes on all the currency. There's a lot of things that change when it passes from one to the next. When King Charles gave the speech the day after his mother passed, he said something that struck me and was so strong in my spirit that it's just hung around in my mind. And he said, she was a promise with destiny kept. When we're born into the family of God and we lay our lives down and receive God's salvation, there is a destiny and a promise on our lives that is set into motion. When she was born, when the queen was physically born, there was a set path ahead. But she could have chosen another way. Can you imagine? I think she was, was it 22 years old when she began to reign? Can you imagine how daunting that must have been? But she did not abdicate. She stayed the course. She lived her life for the people. She lived her life for the call. She kept that promise that was on her life. God has placed a promise within each of us, a promise upon our life, and it's our duty to make sure that the destiny of our promise is carried out and kept and that we hold fast to that promise. Number two, you have to realize what you have. So yes, we've received salvation, we've received forgiveness, and I think it becomes so common 
to us that we don't really understand and grasp the worth and the value of what we have. We have a peace that the rest of the world doesn't know about. We have a joy that's beyond happiness. See, what the world chases is happiness. Happiness is momentary. Happiness can be bought because happiness is temporal. It's temporary. I read a quote the other day. It said, they say you can't buy happiness, money can't buy happiness, but you can buy cupcakes, which is pretty much the same thing, right? (laughs) So you can buy momentary happiness, but joy is that thing which goes deeper that you have even when you're not happy. Even when you don't feel those ushy gushy squishy awesome feelings of how of how wonderful life is, right? Joy is that step beyond. We have a joy. Martin Luther, he was raised in Germany and he his father wanted him to become a lawyer. And he was sent away to school. He gained his master's degree was a brilliant individual, brilliant mind. But he was in a storm and was um, nearly taken out by lightning in this storm. And he felt like that was God was speaking to him to heed the call that he had felt on his life earlier in his life, before his dad said, no, you're going to college instead. (laughs) And he joined the monastery And he began to study the Catholic faith and grow deeper and deeper in the Catholic faith and gave up his life for the faith. And one of the things that was common of the day, it's this idea of penance. And if you can punish yourself enough, you can bring forgiveness for your sins. And so Martin Luther would flog himself to the point of blood to pay his price, not yet understanding that what was rightfully his was something greater, something far beyond, because no amount of human bloodshed by hundreds of thousands of millions of people throughout time could ever have satisfied the sin debt that we all owe. So Christ made a way for something better. The Lord opened Martin Luther's eyes. There was a better way. The concept of grace through faith began to birth in his heart. And he realized there was a better way. He realized what he had. He realized the worth in the words of God. We must realize what we have. In realizing what we have, we have to be confident that there is nothing better, that nothing compares. Psalm 16, 5, the verse just before the goodly heritage verse, it says, the Lord is my portion and my cup. He is my everything, and then some. It's like the psalmist David here is saying, my God is all that and a bag of chips. He is everything, and then goes beyond. John 6, 66 through 69 Peter says, to whom shall we go? He realized if Christ were to go away, there is nothing else. A large portion of Jesus' disciples in this passage had, had fallen away, had walked away, had abandoned, and the core 12 was left. This was the defining moment for that core 12. And Peter says, if we leave you, where... Where would we go? To whom shall we go? There is nothing else. Our spiritual inheritance in Christ, it's everything. 
And it's not just beneficial to us, but it's attractive to the world. When you begin to lay hold of the things that God has for you, people are going to be attracted to you. They're, it's like a magnet. They just, they want to talk to you. They want to wait your table. They want to get close to you. They want to know more about you. I watch this with my parents all the time. Restaurants, we go in. Waiters and waitresses are like, oh, I, wanna, I want their table. Make sure, and then before they leave, make sure you request me next time. Now, they're not handing out pamphlets or tracts or anything like that. It's the Holy Spirit that draws them. Funny story, my mom was getting her nails done the other day, and she um, was talking to the girl, and somehow church came up, and the gal found out that my mom went to church, and my mom, uh, she said, yeah, I went to church one time. She said, I went to church, and they spoke in tongues. She said, that freaked me out. She's like, did you know people do that? And so my mom, she plays it cool. She's like, oh, yeah. She's like, I've heard of that. <laughs> so the conversation moves to a little different subject, and then it gets quiet. And mom leans down and whispers in the girl's ear. She's like, hey. She's like, I speak in tongues. <laughs> and the girl goes, oh, you do? She's like, well, tell me about it. Yeah. Isn't that powerful? When people see what you have, they're attracted to it. Ben was in the military, and he would find that these guys that had kids older than him in conversations would come to him and say, Ben, I don't want my boys to be like me. I want my boys to be like you. They saw something in Ben that they wanted. They didn't know how to get it. There's a story in the Bible in 1 Kings 21. It's a story of Naboth. And he was a descendant of the tribe of Manasseh and was blessed. And does anybody remember King Ahab and Queen Jezebel? Yeah. So Naboth's property was adjacent to King Ahab's palace or realm or whatever. And King Ahab wanted desperately this land. And Naboth is like, God forbid if I give up this land, which is my inheritance. See, in the, after the promised land was given to the people of God, the lines were divided. So when that scripture says, the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places, it's talking about property lines, family property lines. So they divided the land, and it passed from one generation to the next. And it was against their law for the land to pass to somebody outside of their tribe because the land was given by God. So when Naboth talks about this, he's basically saying, I get what I have, and I am not giving it up because it is more precious to me than my life. It is more precious to me than anything of value you might offer me because God gave me this through my generations. This is my inheritance, and it is my heritage. As the story goes, <clears throat> Jezebel, she's full of wisdom, speaks up and goes, well, Ahab, just kill him and take it. Like, what's the big deal? I don't get what your problem is. <laughs> God. Can you imagine? Okay, King Ahab was raised in the faith, was raised 
with a Hebrew heritage, and he marries Jezebel, <clears throat> who was one of the, uh, she wasn't a prophet of Baal, but she was a, uh, I don't know, she was high up in the ranks. Let's just say she was a pastor of Baal, right? <laughs> oh, I can't think of the word. But uh, he marries this gal, and in doing so, he thwarted his spiritual inheritance. So now he's tied to this girl. Can you imagine King Ahab going into the synagogue with Jezebel behind him? That, that was not about to work. So he abandoned and forsook his heritage. So he listened to his wife. He's full of wisdom also. <clears throat> Clearly a, a couple good decision makers here. And he goes and slays not only Naboth, but his two sons. He's like, I'm not even taking a chance on anybody coming back. Because he understood that the land could be reclaimed by the original tribe. Anywho, does anybody know how King Ahab and Jezebel died? They were the only royals to have ever been eaten by dogs. And it was because of this moment, this instant, set aside everything else terrible that they did. But it was this story, this death, this claiming of land that was not theirs, that caused God to enact that wrath upon them. It said all that was left were their hands, their feet, and their head. You've got to hold on to what you have. You have to know what you have. It's precious. It's not worth being sold. It is not worth the sellout. Don't do it. Nothing is worth giving up what you have. Number three, we must have gratitude for what we have. When you know what you have, gratitude is automatic, right? I heard a quote this week in a worship song, and it said there was a study that took place and said that anxiety and gratitude cannot exist in the brain at the same time. So I'm not saying if you battle anxiety in this house that you're an ungrateful person. That's not what that means. What it means is when the spirit of anxiety tries to wage war on you, now you know how to fight back because you know who you are, you know what you have, and you're grateful for it. You begin to stir those things up and just begin to thank God for your godly heritage. You begin to thank God for your salvation and your sound mind and everything that he has given you, promised you, that even the things you have not yet realized and are not yet walking in or living in, thank him for it. Hebrews 12, 28 says, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. What we're receiving is going to require grace. There's a prayer right in the middle of that, and it says, Since we are receiving the kingdom which cannot be shaken, God, let us have grace. Give us the grace that it's going to take because if it's a kingdom that's not going to be shaken, the enemy's going to try to shake it. The enemy's going to stir some things up and try to get you distracted. You're going to need grace to receive this kingdom. You're going to need grace to receive your godly inheritance. David received his inheritance with humility. He realized that he had nothing to do with what God had given him. He said, the lines have fallen unto me. Basically, it's fallen my lot to be blessed. I didn't do this. I didn't buy this position. I didn't sign up to be king. I was chosen God gave me this position. God put me in this place. That word pleasant there means delightful. The lines have fallen into me in delightful places. 
almost makes me think of Psalm 23 where he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lead, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. This is that delightful place that David was talking about. It was his inheritance. He had been given a precious gift. And in that Psalm 16, he says, my goodness is nothing apart from you. Humility, so important to receiving our godly inheritance. You know, that chapter, Psalm 16, at the beginning of it, it says a mikta. M-I-C-H-T-A or M-I-K-T-A. And there's only a handful of psalms in the book of Psalms that are given that title. I think it's six total. And nobody's really been able to figure out what that word means. So it's like one of those things where they just, just what the word sounded like. They made up an English version of it that sounded good, looked good, phonetically worked. But some scholars believe that it means golden. Or it's like to be engraved in gold. And there's other scholars from an, another field of study, and they believe that it means secret or hidden. And my interpretation that, is that this, what David's talking about in Psalm 16, that it's like, it's like the secret hidden treasure. There is so much packed into this about our godly heritage and how we should operate within it. That it's like the secret hidden treasure, like the wisdom of old imparted to us, worthy of being engraved. Some people felt like that this was one of the Psalms that they said was worthy to be engraved in stone or in gold. We must receive with humility this inheritance. Number five, we must honor the inheritance. Okay, so we accept it, we realize what we have, we're grateful for it, we receive it with humility, and we honor the inheritance. You honor the inheritance by rediscovering the truth. All right, so let's take Greg and Laura, for example. You guys fleshed out your faith. You worked out your salvation with fear and trembling, and you've passed everything you've known and learned to Noah. And Noah's received this godly inheritance, this heritage of the faith. But he has to rediscover it for himself in order to honor what his parents passed down to him. So as we receive it, we rediscover it. It's like going through an old picture album. You inherit a picture album. And you don't just take it and be like, oh, this is great, this is awesome. But no, like you, you peel back the pages and you start, look, who is that? I want to know who that is. And you pull the picture out of the sleeve and flip around the back and see if somebody wrote something on the back. What year was this? What were we doing in this in this moment. That's what we've got to do with our faith. And so young people in this house and, and young Christians in this house, whether you're young of age number or not, if you're new to the faith, you need to start rediscovering this truth and this heritage for yourself. Unpack it. Unwrap it. There's a quote that says, truth unless rediscovered becomes tradition. And that doesn't mean tradition is bad. But it's like the lady who lopped off the end of the ham and put it in the pot and her daughter did it and her daughter did it. And finally someone asked, why do we cut the rear end off of the ham? And I'm like, well, my mama did it. So they go talk to grandma. Well, my mama did it. Go talk to great grandma. Well, my pan was too short. So I cut off the end of the ham. <laughs> Truth, unless rediscovered, becomes tradition and tradition is not bad but we need to know why we're holding fast to the traditions of our faith religion is not bad but without the relationship 
it is just that. It is a ritual. It lacks meaning. It lacks purpose. Rediscover the truth, maintain the tradition, and believe wholeheartedly that now it is my job to hold it, to uphold and keep it, to keep it pure, to add to it, and to strengthen it. A couple weeks ago, we talked about passing things up to the next generation, that it should become greater and more multiplied and more valuable with every generation. We serve an exceedingly great God. He's great right now, and 10 seconds from now, he's even better. He is exceedingly great, and that's what the spiritual heritage should be as we pass it to our children and our grandchildren. It should become exceedingly great, and you know how that happens? We all put in the work. We all add to the heritage. We all contribute prayer, fasting, uh, worship. We all must add to it. Often the third generation is lost. So many times in Bible times you get to the third generation and it's like, wait a second, what just happened? Elijah and Elisha. Elisha had a double portion. But where was Elisha's son in the spirit to pass it down to? He was found unfaithful. He forfeited because he had not had to work, put in the work like Elisha did. If Elijah fasted, Elisha fasted. He put in the work. It is so important that we not protect our kids from the work that it takes. The prayer, the devotion, don't protect them from, don't protect him from the hard questions, the hard stuff. Now, obviously, you use wisdom and you protect them from things that would harm their mind and harm their spirit. But they need to know what it took to get where you are. They need to know, I needed to know about my parents having so little finances to work with that there were days that there was nothing, not a can in the cupboard to put on the table because it made room for what God could do. I need to know about that. And if I get to the place where my cupboards are bare, my parents don't need to come in And fill them up for me. I need to turn to Jesus. I need to know who the author and finisher of my faith is. It is vitally important that you show your children how to pray for the things they desire. I heard an awesome story the other day. Tyler and Chris, I don't see them here today. They went to a Clippers game. And... Justice, he's 10 or 11. Did he just turn 11 this year? He's 11. And he's got his glove, and he's down there where the kids are hanging out to catch foul balls, pop flies. And then sometimes the guys in the dugout will just pitch out a ball. Well, Victory is five, and she didn't understand why she couldn't go down there with the other kids to catch a ball. Well, she's a lot smaller than the other kids. It was further away from her mom and dad than they were comfortable with. So Krista says this. I don't know that I would have thought this way. She's like, well, Victory, just pray about it. Just pray about it. She didn't give in to her request. She told her to turn her eyes on Jesus. Well, a foul ball goes two sections over. This gentleman catches it, and there's a bunch of kids crowd around around him that want that ball, and he goes, no, this is for a little girl over there. And he walked over and gave her that ball. (laughs) 
It is important that your kids learn to pray and wait and see what the Lord does. When I was a kid, I lost a $50 bill, and I was so upset, and I prayed. My parents said pray. They didn't hand me a $50 bill and say, oh, it'll be all right, sweetheart. We prayed. It was at McDonald's. And the Lord convicted the heart of the person that saw me drop it and picked it up. And they brought me something like $54 and some change, or uh, $44 and some change, because they had needed it to buy breakfast with. So the Lord taught me a couple things in that. that if something goes missing and somebody takes it, that maybe they needed it more than me. But also that if I pray, God will act. God will hear my prayers and respond. Teach your children to pray, to press in, to wait on the Lord, to put in the work, to make the sacrifice. The next thing is we guard the inheritance. The enemy, the devil, roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may. Not who he will, who he may. And you've got to decide whether you're one of those may devour people. Are you going to let the enemy come in and steal your inheritance and take what's rightfully yours? Are you going to stand up and defend the inheritance of the kingdom of God? Are you going to guard it and protect it? Pray over it. Plead the blood of Jesus. When COVID hit, it took over this nation and turned everybody's brains to jello for two years. I felt so drawn to plead the blood of Jesus over my home and my family every day, sometimes 15 or 20 times a day. Plead the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood of Jesus over my baby. I plead the blood of Jesus over my husband, over my daddy. He was one of those high-risk people they talked about. I plead the blood of Jesus. It works. It's important because what the blood of Jesus can guard and save you from, nothing else can guard and save you from. When you plead the blood of Jesus, you have no idea what you're guarding yourself from. What spirits are out seeking to devour you? We don't know. I wish we had eyes of the spirit to see all the time what the enemy's throwing at us. But we live in these fleshly bodies. We can't see it all. We don't know it all. So we plead the blood of Jesus. We pray in the Holy Spirit. We guard the inheritance. The last thing is that you pass it on. It is to be given away. The inheritance that you've been given, that you're pouring into, that you're building, that you're guarding, that you're strengthening, we can't be closed-fisted with it. Give it away. We pass it on. Kindness, pass it on. That's been a buzzword. We pass it on. Going back to the story of Ben's army buddies, they wanted their boys to be like him, but they couldn't give their sons what they did not have. This takes us all the way back to number one. We're on point seven. Takes us back to number one where you accept it. You lay hold of it. You say, this is mine. This is who I am. So that when the time comes for you to pass it on, you have something to give. You cannot give what you do not have. It's so important to have that inheritance to give. We pass on a godly heritage through prayer, worship, dedication to the house of God, putting the things of God first in our priority through tithes and offering. You know, Levi was blessed 
because Melchizedek, hundreds of years prior, tithed? The generational blessing of God is unto a thousand generations. So the things we lay into the ground now, our blessing continually pours out into the future generations. A love for God's word. Teach your kids to love this. Love this. Going back to COVID, things were scary, and I would just sit in prayer and just hold my Bible. Lord, don't let them take it from me. God, I need your word. Show me something to get me through this. Teach your kids to love this, to love the stories. And they're not just patty cake stories. Make sure your kids know they're not like Disney fairy tales. They're real. They happen. This is the infallible, inherent word of God. It's not a toy. It's a treasure. Speak life over your family. Bless your children. Don't curse your children in seasons of rebellion. Your child may be experiencing a season of rebellion. Don't tell your child they're rebellious because that is not who they are. It's what they're doing, but it is not who they are. You speak life. You speak the truth of their heritage. Who they are. You speak it in the face of the devil. Satan is a liar and the father of them. And he might have them deceived, but he cannot take what is not his. The enemy wants to disconnect us from the family of God. He wants to cause division in the people of God so that he can divide the inheritance. More family fights happen over inheritance. Jacob and Esau fighting over the double birthright. Of the firstborn. Since the message from a couple weeks ago about getting connected and being unified with the body of Christ, it has become fully apparent that the enemy does not want his people connected, deeply rooted, grounded. And it's not because he doesn't like you and he doesn't want you to have good friendships. It has nothing to do with that. He could care less about your happiness and your friendships. He wants to divide the inheritance of God's kingdom. He wants to keep you from your godly heritage. He wants, you to, he wants to keep you from who you are in him. Don't give in to it. The enemy does not like it when the people of God start unifying and functioning as it's supposed to be. He will fight tooth and nail to divide you from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And in doing so, divide the inheritance and destroy the legacy of God's people. You have got to know who your enemy is. It is not in the face of the person you can't stand... It is not in the face of the person that did you wrong. It is the devil who roams about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Don't let yourself fall prey to his devices. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You can't do it on your own. If you've got conflict with a brother or sister, call for help. Go to the word of God. Pray about it. Quit being mad at that person and get mad at the devil. 
In the story of Joseph, Joseph forgave his brothers. And then he was able to share his wealth with them. He even went so far as to say, what you meant for evil, God turned it to good. If I can have the band come. Do not let your godly inheritance die because of petty conflict. Do not let it die because of distraction. Do not let it die because your priorities are whacked out. Keep this front and center. Keep Christ at the center of it all. This week when I was working on this lesson... Mom and dad are out of town, so Simeon was with me. Ben had some work stuff to take care of. So I had Simeon, so I'm trying to prepare this message. And if I heard mommy watch this once, I heard it a thousand times. So I thought, well, I'll turn on the TV, get him distracted and still for a minute. Sometimes as a mom, you just have to use that tool. Don't hate me. He wanted to watch a race car show where they build race cars. So I'm like, okay. So I turn it on. Jason, you have that picture? <laughs> so I'm there studying on the couch, and guess where Simeon's watching his race car show from? <laughs> I like that double chin. It's a great angle. It's my best side. Um... But I wouldn't have it any other way. Him looking over my shoulder while I'm reading the word of God. I want him to have this inheritance. I want him to see me read this. Ben, hold up his Bible. This is Simi's Bible. I want him to come into church every day, every Sunday with that under his arm like my parents taught me. He's not a distraction. He's my future. He's our future. Your children are the future of the kingdom of God and they are receiving an inheritance. They are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And if you have children that are away from the Lord, don't lose heart. I speak salvation to your household. That your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren will walk with the Lord. The word of the Lord says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the house of the Lord. This is our greenhouse. This is our place. There's just something about it, the house of the Lord, and I am grateful. If you would stand with me, and I wish our kids were in here, but I want to take some time and and be really intentional about our words. We're going to sing the blessing. And I want us to sing it on purpose. I want it not to just be a song. I want it to be a declaration from your mouth. And it's not just from me to you, but I receive it from you to me. That's how this works, blessing one another, blessing our children. Our words are so powerful.